give it my hands up. I think I think Mickey's asleep out there. I don't know if they're gonna get a bell or not. Duke, Duke Miner. Yeah, I've heard he's an Auburn fan, yeah. Y'all yeah, don't hold that against him. He's from, he's from, he's from L.A., Lower Alabama. You would take your uh, songbooks or look up on the screen, I guess. We're going to sing number 590. 590 here in just a moment. Carrie will lead us in that song. And after he leads us in a song, we'll have a, a prayer by Brother Glenn Lewis. I've always wanted to stand up before an audience to introduce a speaker and say, here's a man who needs no introduction. And then just sit down. And I was going to do that tonight. But then I got to thinking that there are some people that uh, are probably visiting or those who have recently come our way and placed membership that don't know Don. So Don used to be here uh, with us, uh, worship with us, work with us. Um, he's moved to L.A. Y'all get that in a little bit. Um, and I've been told that he's an Auburn fan, somebody said. So there are some things that I didn't even know about him that I couldn't introduce you to him about some aspects, but uh, we look forward to him coming back and being with us again, and of course we miss him, and I'm glad he makes it back on occasion that he's back with us tonight to speak to us on the communications in the family. And uh, we're glad he's here. And, and um, if he's, there's more he won't say it, then he can say it when he gets up here. But uh, So we'll sing number 590, and then Glenn will lead us in prayer, and then we'll turn the floor to Don Dukeman here. Okay, let's sing the first couple of stanzas, please. <clears throat> a pilgrim was I and a wandering In the cold night of sin I did wrong When Jesus the kind shepherd found me Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us and all the good things you do for us. We're thankful to have Brother Don back with us tonight. We ask that you bless him with a, a good recollection of what he's prepared. and We ask that you bless him with a long, useful life in your service. Father, watch over us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm really not sure how to respond to that introduction. Um, 
I don't know if I should take some shots while I'm up here. See, that's the privilege of being the speaker for the evening. And no matter what they say, you get to take shots after because you get 45 minutes worth of it. So I'm going to hold off for a few minutes and uh, we'll do that. But it is good to be here tonight. I did drive up late last night from L.A., as we'll, as we'll call it. I'm not sure it's what I want to call it, but that's what we'll call it right now. And um, it's, it's great to be home, but I'm not here for very long because I fly out bright and early in the morning. So uh, I'm going to be gone for a couple of days and then I'll come back in. I'm, I'm sure you're probably sick and tired of seeing me by now because I've been in and out here so much. And uh, being able to come home and visit for a couple of days and, and see everybody is, is definitely great. Um, but there are a couple of things that, that I do want to make mention. There's a couple of rumors I've heard about me since I've been gone. So let me address those real quick. Um, as the, uh, there were a couple of crazy ladies honking at me earlier or whatever, but anyway. Um, first of all, I do live at the beach now, and I do live on beach time. So there's no rush, there is no hurry. So if we go past 8 o'clock, you're on beach time, because that's what I'm on now. So we may stay here for a little while, all right? There's, there's no rush at the beach. Um, I did get asked a question about how I'm dressing now. And so Jim was a little worried before I came here tonight about what I might wear. And he told me I was a little overdressed. And I said, well, if I really wanted to, I could dress like this and come tonight. Um, this is how I dress nowadays at the beach. I wear the tie, but with the bathing suit. So when I go to work, this is what I look like, just, just so you, um, you have a picture. Um, the Kenny Chesney song for years ago, no shoes, no shirt, no problem. Well, that's true. So that's me every day. Um, tonight, our topic is communication in our families. And I forewarned many of you that I was speaking tonight. So if you start feeling sick and you get up and you walk out, uh, I'm going to understand why. Because you probably surely don't want to listen to me uh, for the next little bit. You know, this is a topic that I studied for four and a half years. I've been practicing for 13 and still have no clue what we're talking about. Um, I'm sure many of you are probably thinking right now that I, I, I need no lesson in communications. Uh, I know everything, I know what to say, I know what to do, but sometimes things come around and, and happen in our lives where we just don't know. Uh, I'd love to just go back in the back room back there and ask Miss Lena May how she's dealt with GL for over 60 years and how she talks to him, and we could all just leave probably, um, because that would just be lesson number one and you wouldn't even need a lesson to me. Um, she might be up here longer than me, though, if, if that might be the case. So um, we're going to talk about this topic tonight, about how we communicate with our families, our loved ones, uh, and those around us. And, and hopefully you'll take away uh, something from tonight's lesson. When we think about communication, I'm sure you probably see this image over my head, and that's what you think. And I'm not being sexist, so don't look at me with those evil eyes right now. Been in a male and, a, and, a, and Seth says true, just so everybody heard that. Not Dawn, Seth said that, okay? But when we think about communication, this is probably what we think of most of the time. That when you have two males talking, it's very similar. You know what they're saying. Um, there's not much else. You get two females together, and I'm going to let the pitcher speak, because I'm not going to say anything else, because I'll get in trouble after. Um, I would say that if we were to take a survey of our families tonight and, and go around and ask married couples that have been married for a long period of time, compared to those that have been married for a short period of time, I would probably say that number one, or if not number one, at least probably in the top five problems within those families is communication. And if we're honest with ourselves, the most important component of a family relationship is the importance of communication and conversation in a lifelong relationship. If you can't communicate, if you can't talk, if you can't share problems, you can't share worries, you can't share happiness, you can't share all your expressions and feelings, then what are we doing as a family? How are we getting to know one another? You see, communication is the cornerstone to a healthy relationship. And a healthy relationship does not exist without effective communication. If we can't talk, then how can we be effective? You see, I, I'm not married, but I, I, I can probably guess very closely to think about that the desire for, for many of you and your mates is to be your best friend. That you can talk about any problem that comes up, that you can talk about anything that you have to deal with. So what are the components to an effective relationship? And you can look up at the slide above my head and see, this is just one example, but five different components to an effective relationship, to making it strong. And what's number one on that list? is communication. Communication. 
So tonight, my hope is to offer three suggestions to you that we can consider on how to improve our communications with our families, both earthly and spiritual. So number one, and there is no outline, I apologize, I didn't give you any work to do tonight, uh, but number one is to make it positive. Number one is make it positive. It's unfortunate that we live in a society today where everything is so negative. You can't go anywhere without negativity just slapping you right in the face. Um, we've got some family friends that we've known for a long time, and the wife had started noticing that the husband just, for some reason, just wasn't watching the news anymore. And it was kind of like one of his daily rituals that, that he would cut the news on it, says clock, watch it, and then kind of get into his nightly rhythm. But for a while, he just wasn't watching the news. And so one day the wife said, you know, hey, what's up? Why aren't you watching the news? And he said, well, I can tell you the news in five seconds. There was an accident on this street. Somebody got shot on this street. There's road construction, and it's going to rain. And that's it. And I truly believe that's about the extent of news most of the time. I find it hard sometimes that we turn into these, these news stations and these news channels, and all we hear is negative, 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 negative. And then you get to the last two-minute segment, and, and the way TV is done is it's broken down in segments. You have uh, five to six different segments in a newscast. And you get to the very last segment, which is about two minutes, and that's when they talk about something positive, something good. So we spend 58 minutes talking about all this negative stuff going on, and then we spend two minutes talking about something positive to lift us up and encourage us. And we question ourselves as to go, why? Why can't it be 58 minutes of positive stuff and two minutes of negative stuff? You see, number one, neg negativity impacts your actions. You see, negativity can affect us every day. We have a bad day, and we bring it home. We go to work, or, or someone puts us in a bad mood, and what do we do? We take that out on others. If things don't go our way, so we feel that the world and everyone else is against us. You see, negativity corrupts our attitudes. And then, in the same right, negativity then impacts the way we treat others. So what do you allow to control your life? How do you control the negativity? How do you control the positivity? All those different aspects that come into your life. And the second question is, is when a bad day happens, how do we respond and react? Because we all have bad days. Some of you, uh, somebody said something to me earlier, it was just one of those days. Every, every one of us have a bad day every now and then. And it's how we react. You know, we come home and instead of being happy to see our families, we make them miserable and, and moody, just the same as we are. You know, the dog, our dogs and animals love us as soon as we walk in the door, but what happens? We're such in a bad mood, we, we kick the dog or we kick the cat and tell them to go away. You know, our children, they want us to play with us, but we tell them we're too busy or we're just not in the right mood. I think we get so blindsided by negativity that we don't care enough to ask them how, they, how their day was. To talk about all the positive things, to talk about the good that happened to them today. Maybe something happened that they've been struggling with and maybe they overcame it somehow. And instead of being more focused on talking to them about what happened good, we're focused on the negativity. You see, we get so busy just dealing with life and, and dealing with stress and the issues that come up that sometimes we forget about the important things in our life. And that's our families. And that's the people around us that are essential to who we are. You know, sometimes we ask the question is, why can't we just leave the world's negativity at the door? You know, when you, when you come up to the doorstep and you have your mat and you just, you, you know, when you, when you have dirty shoes on, you just take it and you rub your, your, your feet on that mat to get all the dirt from coming inside. Why can't we do that with our lives? Why can't we just brush it off at the door and then go in and be happy to see our families? When we come home and we don't think about the positive, how can we enjoy God's blessings that are right in front of us? How can we enjoy those good things? You see, sometimes what we put into our lives control the way we live, it controls the way we work, and it controls the way we share with loved ones. So the question then becomes, is what is in our heart? What is in our heart? You see, God knows our hearts. But what if our families and our friends could see inside of them? All that stuff that you hide deep down in it that you think nobody can see, what do our hearts say about us? Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 15. 
Peter talking about the heart of man here says this. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still lacking understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands is not defile the man. What does verse 18 tell us right there? It tells us that the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. So we go back to asking that question again, is what's in our heart? Are we focused on the positive or the negative? You see, because number two is we should be counting our blessings and not our problems. We should count our blessings and not our problems. We should never forget how blessed we are. Let me pray, repeat that again. We should never forget how blessed we are. Do we truly understand what God has provided to us in our lives? Do we understand how blessed of a people, not just as a nation, but as individuals, how blessed we truly are? We don't also need to focus on the negative when we have so much to be positive about. See, positive thinking is more than just a tagline or something we say. It has to be that it changes our behavior. It has to affect our lives and the way we live and we work and we play again. And see, I think that we need, to believe, we need to be positive because not only does it make us better, but it also makes those around us better at the same time. You see, we realize that the world is going to try and drag us down and make us believe that there's not good anymore. We go back to those news telecasts. That's what they're going to make us believe, that there is no good in this world anymore until you get to the last two minutes. Do we look at our life sometimes like that? that we take the, the 28 or the 58 minutes and that's all our life is about, is about that negative and, and don't really focus on the, the last two minutes that's positive and uplifting and encouraging. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 directs us to not love the world nor the things in the world. Again, in the world, how does that positive and that negative affect us? You see, our surroundings affect our emotions. And it impacts and dictates how we treat others. What we take home, how we interact with our families, our friends, our colleagues, strangers, is all determined by what we put into our lives. So I ask you the question, are we positive or negative? Number two tonight, make it personal. So in our communication with our families, first we make it positive, and then second, we make it personal. Make it personal. I think one of the biggest problems that we have today in, in today's world is that we worry so much about perception and, and how others might view or judge us that we get blindsided. And I think at times that that scares us into getting closer to people, into being unwilling to, to open up and to share what our, what our problems and what hurts us and what we deal with. You see, when we make it personal, sometimes pride keeps us from fulfillment. Pride often prevents us from asking for help from those closest to us because maybe we're embarrassed or frustrated or maybe it's because we just don't want others to know what's wrong. Maybe we hide and shut out loved ones hoping that everything will just work out, that if we do it our way, things will just solve its own problems. And sometimes I think we fool ourselves into thinking that we can handle and manage the crisis all on our own. You go to the store and, and you buy a new product and, and you take it and you dump it all out on the floor and you pick up the instruction manual and you go, mm, nah, I don't need that. And we start putting things together and, and we, we get finished and then there's a few extra parts sitting over there on the floor and go, I think those are supposed to go somewhere. Do we do that in our lives sometimes? that we just take the instruction manual in our lives and we just say, oh, I don't need that. That we take the thoughts and the well wishes and you know, the sentiment for others that, hey, if you ever need me, I'm, I'm a phone call, I'm a text, I'm a visit away, and we just say, man, I don't need that. Is pride keeping us from fulfilling what God has in store for us? You see, I think we live in a world today where people struggle with the pressure of life and that we hold it 
and let it get the best of us. You see, I think as humans, sometimes we're too arrogant to get personal and share with others our struggles, our problems, our fears, our worries, because we think we can handle it all alone and by ourselves. You see, pride keeps us from overcoming obstacles. We forget that God desires a personal relationship with all of us. And instead of relying and trusting in His Word and what He tells us, we think that old number one knows what's best for us. We think that old number one has the best plan for our lives. And that if we just simply follow the path that, that we want, that we'll solve the riddle. That we'll be able to put that puzzle together. You see, He made it personal when He sent His Son to die for us. He wants that personal relationship. Sometimes I think we need to consider a relationship that Jesus had with his disciples. He knew them personally. He knew their problems. He knew what they were dealing with. See, sometimes I think we like to use God as a wishing well. That when things are going well, when, when things are right in our lives and things are perfect, we don't take the time to make it personal with him to just say, thank you. And we move along and we, and we go through a couple of weeks and everything's working out fine. And then all of a sudden a problem comes along. And then another one, and another one. And, and what do we look at and we talk about with the snowball example before? It just keeps piling up and piling up and piling up. Until we get so bad and so caught up that in, instead of turning to God, then we turn to Him. And we make, hey God, if you do this, I promise I'll change. God, if you let this, this problem, this situation, just leave me and go somewhere else, I promise I'll change. And then what happens when it does change, when it does get better? We go back to our same problems again. You see, I believe that God has put people in our lives to help us, to guide us, to be there for you, and at some times to save you. You see, number two is personal relationships develop life-changing attitudes. Personal relationships help develop life-changing attitudes. I read this in a book the other day, and it worked perfect. I, I want to read this to you, and it talks about how to develop and keep strong relationships. And this is what it says. It says, number one, families have to talk about things, the good and the bad. I tell my team all the time at work, when we start talking about stuff, I want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to know everything. I want to put it all out there on the table. It keeps going. They have to build trust. They have to be honest. They have to be faithful to one another. They have to be there for one another. Knowing that having arguments are normal. We're going to fight and we're going to fuss from time to time. But that's normal. It's how we deal with it. We also have to know that at times we're going to be unhappy. There are going to be things that upset us and, and, and make us mad. When families and how to develop and keep strong relationships, it continues when it says, families need to appreciate the flaws and appreciate each other. And that families must become best friends. And lastly, love each other unconditionally. When we communicate, when we share with one another, do we tell each other that we love you? Yeah, we tell maybe when we hang up on our phone calls or maybe in a text at the end of the day. But when we tell them that, do we mean it? Do we tell them that a lot? Do we tell it when maybe we don't feel like it, but maybe we need to, to keep telling them? I was asked to speak at an event in April, flew out to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was asked to speak to about a group of 300 people. And we focus on making the most of relationships. And as I was asked to speak in front of some of my uh, colleagues and my industry peers and all that, Yes, you all know me. I'm a little crazy, and sometimes I like to jump on tables and chairs and try to get attention. But the main focus that night was to talk about how you can develop lasting relationships with those around us. I've developed so many friendships within the industry I've worked in that when something's wrong or something happens, guess who are some of the first people I hear from? Hey, you okay? Hey, is everything all right? When we had the tornado down in Foley in April when we were gone, Guess who started reaching out? Hey, everything okay? Everything good? I mean, those are what we need. Those are the type of relationships that we need. You see, you and I need the special relationships that we've been blessed with, not only to survive, 
but also to thrive in this impossible world. We don't allow the world to choke out the authentic people in our lives to make it mean something less than what it actually is. So two questions I ask you right here is, number one is, why can't we be personal? Why can't we open up? Why can't we share? Why can't we express our feelings to others? And then number two is what fears or what concerns keep us from drawing closer with one another? What are those things that, that keep us from drawing closer to one another? I want to do something, and I hope Jim and Carrie and Mac will indulge me for a minute and not get mad at me, but I know many of you probably have your cell phones out right now, and typically we probably wouldn't do this, but I think it's fitting with what we're talking about right now that I want, to, I want everybody to participate in something. If you got your phone, you can do it. If not, I'm going to put something up here on the board here in a minute. I want you to do it. A speaker at a conference a few years ago did this example. And it really kind of stood out because most of the time when we're at conferences and you know we're sitting in lunches or stuff like that, most everybody's kind of got their phones out. They, they pull them out and they start looking at emails or, or what's going on or, or, or whatever they got going on in their world. And he said, I'm going to change things up tonight. And he said, I'm going to do something different. And he started talking about personal relationships and, and, and what we mean to other people. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to think about somebody in your life right now. Somebody maybe you haven't talked to in a while. Maybe somebody you've been thinking about. And I'm going to put this message up here on the board here in a minute. And I want you to send that text to this person. And I don't want it to just be somebody you talk to every day. I don't want it to be somebody that, that maybe you got a deep relationship with. But I want you to think hard and long about somebody that maybe you know that needs it. Maybe somebody that needs an encouraging word. And so I want you to, I want you to, put, I want you to, put, to put this in the text. I was thinking about you. I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your friendship. I love you. That's all I want you to say. Just put that in the text. Send it to somebody you think that, need, that needs it right now. And I promise you, you're going to get a response that's probably either going to number one, make you understand that you just changed somebody's life or on, this, on the funny side, somebody's going to think you're going crazy. Hopefully, I think it's on the first side. We did this that day at that lunch and we, all the people at our table were, were, were sitting there waiting. And I'd, I would love if anybody has sent it and they get a response, just raise your hand and I'll point at you. I'm, I'm not making this have to be, you have to do it now, but if you do, I'd love to see the reaction and response to this. But anyway, we were sitting there at the table, and some of our, uh, our, our colleagues and friends around the table started getting responses back. Um, my response was, are you going crazy? That's why I said some people are going to think you're going crazy. Um, some other people around our table, their friends thought that, that may, they had been somewhere they probably shouldn't have been a little early in the day. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but we had one girl at the table who got a response. And I get choked up because I think back to that response. The girl just happened to be thinking about a friend who had been dealing with some problems. And they were contemplating suicide. And that text message changed the outcome of what that lady was going to do. Sometimes I think we need to send a text message like this. When we know somebody's struggling, when we know somebody's hurting, even if we know they're happy, we need to send a text message just to tell somebody, hey, I was thinking about you. And I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you. But most importantly, I love you. Wouldn't we just love to get a text, like, text message like that during the day? An email, a phone call? just to know that somebody's thinking about you. That somebody has you in their mind to stop in their day to think about like that. You see, I believe that personal involvement with others is vital to us living healthier and more fulfilling lives. You see, others provide the power at times to achieve goals quicker together than on our own. You see, a true friend is someone who simply loves you for no good reason. 
They don't need you to be anybody other than who you are. Wouldn't life be happier if we told each other all this all the time? If we took the negativity, we took all the negative stories, we took all the bad in our lives and just pushed it to the side and thought about all the positive things in our life and all the friendships and relationships that we have and just thought about that. How fulfilling would our lives be? How much better would it be? And how much better would our life be if we surrounded ourselves with those who love and care for us the most? Think about that. If you're important to me, you're going to be in my life. And if I'm important to you, I'm going to be in your life. How important are others around us? How can we make it personal? Number three tonight. So we made it positive. We made it personal. And number three, we're going to make it purpose-driven. We're going to make it purpose-driven. Is your family purpose-driven? How about is your family influencing each other in the community in a way that reflects the Creator? How do others see Christ living in you? Now, that's a self-reflective question. It's how do others see Christ living in you? And we're not just talking about the good days when everything seems to be going right, when all is, all is right in the world. But how do others see Christ living in us when things are going bad? And we talked about those days when a coworker or somebody makes us mad or we're just not in a good mood. How does, how does the world see Christ living in us? You see, if we want the communication in our families to be strong and consistent, we have to be clear about how each member of the family plays an important role in the lives of others. You see, external and even internal stresses sometimes cause stress on families. We feel disconnected. We struggle to maintain vital life-giving relationships. But I truly believe the majority of the problems stem from a lack of purpose, a lack of understanding, and a lack of communication. You see, sometimes we forget that we have our families that will listen. When we need a shoulder to cry on or an ear to listen, we have family members that are willing to do that, that will care for us. But most importantly, we have family members who will love us no matter what. No matter how many mistakes you make, no matter how many, how many meals you burn, no matter what in our lives, we have family members that will love us. You see, as families, when we work together to help one another be their best, we help them, number one, to find their purpose. Number two, to find their objectives. Number three, reach their dreams. Number four, fulfill their ambitions. And number six, achieve their goals. You see, sometimes when we sacrifice family and friendships to gain a few more dollars or climb up the corporate ladder, as we would call it, or to do something more personal, sometimes it turns out to be the devil's bargain. Sometimes we trade in time with our families and the most important time with those that we love for things that don't mean a darn thing. Then in the grand scheme of things that you could lose it tomorrow. In marriage and in life, sometimes it requires us to make changes to accommodate the marriage of the family. Sometimes we have to give things up. Sometimes we have to do things different. But we have to ensure that we are doing the right things for the best chance of success to promote happiness and well-being for the whole family. From an individual standpoint, I wanna, want you to ask yourself this question tonight. Is number one is how do we serve our purpose? How do we serve our purpose? When you think about your family structure and you think about what your role is, is what is your purpose? How can you make your family better? What are the things that you can do to improve that communication and improve those relationships? What is your purpose? See, how can we best be used for His service? See, I truly believe that we were created to use our gifts and talents to get to know God more intimately, to authentically connect with others, and to help others develop richer relationships with God themselves. You see, sometimes when we think about our purpose, it's not just to be about us, it's to be about others. 
It's to be about how we can bring them closer to God as well. Because our end goal should be, and everybody in this room said our end goal should be to make it to heaven. And if we're not making sure that everybody's there, then what's our purpose? How are we being purpose-driven? I read this book by Dr. Harold Arnold, and he suggests a couple of things that I'm going to suggest to you tonight. And he suggests that for families to be purpose-driven, they should practice the following qualities within their lives. Number one, they need to encourage and build up one another. See, families need to build up one another. Instead of tearing one another down, they listen to the need of others so that they can understand. We talked about that listening year earlier. Are we actually listening? Or are we thinking about our next move? Are we like a politician that's waiting to shake the next hand in the room he's in? Are we truly listening to what the problems and the needs and the struggles and the concerns and the worries and everything else that somebody else is trying to tell you? Are we truly listening? You see, we encourage each other's strengths and strengthen each other's weaknesses. Let me read that again. We encourage each other's strengths and strengthen each other's weaknesses. I deal with problems and struggles that I've never dealt with before. But I promise you, if we went around the room and we talked about it, somebody's dealt with it before. And you can offer me the best advice that I could ever find. And I promise at the same time, maybe you're dealing with something that I have, and in return, I can offer you that advice, those suggestions, those, those tips to maybe t how, to, how to deal with it. You see, we have to be focused on building up and encouraging one another. Some of us guys have a text message that we get every morning, and that encourages us. That's our motivation for the day. It gives us a word to just think about and, and how we can be better that day, how we can improve our lives. So families build up one another. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17 through chapter 5 and verse 2, verse 29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from the mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. You see, families push each other to be their best. Moms and dads would do anything to make sure their, their kids are on the right path or that they have better than what they did. You know, how do we make that work? You see, purpose-driven families believe each individual is great. But as a family system, they are greater than the sum of their parts. With this family synergy, practically anything is possible. We have to consider that as our family here too. That our synergy, that us collectively together is better than an individual. That each one of you play a role in, in, in this congregation and this family to get us to heaven, to make us better, to make us be closer to one another. The second part of that is family's faith is seen and not just heard. You see, families realize that they can push one another to defeat their fears and insecurities. Purpose-driven families know their faith is caught more than taught. We talk about our actions being seen and not just heard. That's this concept right here. That they allow their behaviors to do the speaking for them. See, purpose-driven families cultivate a legacy of leadership by their deeds. They understand that leadership is about influence. And these families recognize that you can only lead where you are willing to go. Therefore, they replace their fears with courage to enter uncharted territories. See, purpose-driven families are transformational. They don't accept the status quo. They are not satisfied with just good enough. And with this motivation, they look for wise and creative ways to influence people to believe in themselves, to care for others, and to change the culture around them. I want to read that again. With this motivation, they look for wise and creative ways to influence people to believe in themselves, to care for others, and to change the culture around them. If others truly see Christ living in us, how is that not a way to influence others to believe, to care for others, and to change that culture at the same time? That no matter whether everything is good and right and just and, and perfect, 
or whether everything is, is bad and going wrong at the same time, that the culture never changes, that our belief never wavers, and that our faith remains strong. That no matter what we say and how we communicate to others, that people know that when we say that we are a believer, that we have been baptized into Christ, that our communication is 100% accurate. There's no doubt. There's no, there's no less that that is true. You see, our families on earth are wonderful gifts from God. And purpose-driven families are engaged in behaviors that become practices that develop into habits. The third one, purpose-driven families also yield influence that impact others. They yield influence that impacts others. You see, the goals for families should be to have extraordinary relationships with one another. It's not just a, hey, how are you? All right, great. And we go to our own separate rooms. We go to our own separate places. That we want to know how their day is. That we want to know what their struggles are. That we want to know what, it, what their happiness is. We want to be invested in their life as much as we can. That it's not just a wavering investment, that it's a 100% complete investment. See, not only should they have extraordinary relationships with one another, but they should yield influence and impact those around them for the better. From a spiritual standpoint as a family, what are we doing for one another to make sure that we're all saved? I promise you, if you're, if you're honest and true to yourself right now, there's probably at least one person, if not more, that's just clicking in your mind right now. And you're thinking about them, and, and you know that, that your relationship with them maybe is, is, is on rocky territory. Maybe it's just not as good as it once was. What are we doing to change that? What are we doing to make that better? How are we communicating with them? You know, we could, we could pull these out, and we, we can text. We can send messages all day long. But everybody loves that personal face-to-face -face communication. We tell that all the time, is you can send an email, but sometimes that communication gets lost in an email. I know I've talked about this story before, and it was on, I think, the slide before or whatever, but my fifth grade speech at Lads Leaders talked about decisions. And in those decisions, I talked about that I just don't love to get side hugs. I like those big old bear hugs. We want to let people know that we love them, that we care for them, that, that we want to be there for them, that we're willing to give them those good old bear hugs. That it's not just a side hug and moving on. So tonight, I ask you to consider how you communicate with your family. Are we being positive? Are we taking out the negativity and bringing in the positivity? Number two, are we being personal? Is it more than just a, a few words and we move on? That it's a life-changing attitude. And it's a life-developing friendship. And number three, that it's purpose-driven. That our goal for our families is them for, to be the best that they can be. And that our goal as a family, both our earth, earthly and spiritual families, is to make it to heaven. So I just asked you that question, but let me ask you again is how are you communicating with your family? Is your family's focus on God? And if so, then like we've talked about with the three points tonight, our families will be more positive, more personal, and more purpose-driven. Thank you for your time and attention.